Good evening and welcome, you beautiful, beautiful people. Uh, welcome to That Paddle Show. Viewers, comments and questions live. Dan here. Mick here, hello. Uh, Mick on the Wonder Knobs. Doing wonderful things. Turning the knobs, making magic happen. <laughs> no change there then. Hope you're all awesome. Welcome, happy Monday everyone. Uh, let us know that you are receiving us loud and clear. Ground control to Major Dan. There's a scary thought. <laughs> uh, how are we all then? Had a nice week? Been doing good things? Enjoying the rain if you're in the United Kingdom? Or enjoying the heat wave if you're in the United States of America? Yes. Or Man. indeed in mainland or, Europe yeah. at the moment. Yeah. Very warm as well. Uh, good. Hello from Los Angeles, California. <laughs> Los Angeles, California is uh, on a Bootsy song I was listening to just yesterday, and I think it might have been Iceberg or Iced Drink who was singing. Oh, okay. It. Yes. Uh, BV, hello BV, and thank you very much for moderating. Is saying probably time to turn the super chats off because we've got too many. So we'll do that. Look, 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 do not disturb, and yet it still does the noise. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, I just, I, I, I hate it. I hate it. I, I, I am, I'm trying to think of a way I can get rid of my phone forever, but it's just not practical in this day and age. Okay. Oh, sorry, BV, I don't hate you. I hate the fact that the phone doesn't um, do what it says it's doing, ever. I've been conducting a survey just recently, and 100% uh, of my phone calls fail. Okay. It's been quite a simple survey. Yep. Every single phone call I make or receive fails. Right. Probably because you throw your phone around. I've never done it before. <laughs> it's 2023. Little tension today. Uh, as is Robert Lewis. Hello, Robert. Greetings from hot and steamy Florida. Well... That sounds good. My wife lived in Florida. Right. We, uh, I got married in Miami. Yeah, nice. Yeah. It was really lovely. Didn't you have an, uh, an anniversary just recently? Did? Yeah. How many? 20. 20. 20. 20 months. Eventy. 20. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. She's a lucky, lucky lady. Hmm. <laughs> Um, Jeremiah McCann is on. Hello from Ashburn, Virginia. Uh, the Wonder Knob says S. Crawford Music. Richard, Richard Chester is on. Evening all from Rainy Cheshire. Sat here with a cuppa in a TPS mug, of course. Oh, Thank you for buying that. KJ uh, Photo, cheers from the Big Apple. Uh, and uh, Michael Keith says, good afternoon from Ohio. Ohio? Oh, hello. Ho. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that didn't go out right. Oh, hello, ho. Oh. Jolly Willard says, uh, what's up, TPS fam? Good morning from Chicago. Hello, Chicago. Greetings from a sunny Chicago. Also, says John O'Neill. How lovely. Um, and uh, Anchorage, Alaska. From Mark Spurgeon. Uh, hot for teacher in Switch Switzerland, says Rax FX. Lovely. TJ Nelson, thank you very much, mate. That's really lovely. And uh, John D. Rao says... Uh, on holiday in the UK. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, iPhones are the bane of our existence. Well, yeah, and you can include all mobile telephones in that. Yeah, not, I don't want to be, you know. Phonist. Phonist about it. The only one I like, there's a company called Punkt, P-U-N-K-T, and they just do a phone that can do text messages. No, okay. No MMS. No, 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 just calls and texts so so you basically, totally useless in the you're, modern world you're, you're after a phone that sort of as you crank it creates sparks and no no as with all these things we t in life we tend to blame the items right you blame right. your car for being rubbish or you blame the computer or you blame what the problem is the relationship with it so i need to renegotiate my less my that relationship is... with my phone yeah. As do you. I So I always feel better when I put the phone down. Turn yeah. It off. You must do 10 hours a day on your phone, I reckon. It's not quite that bad. Eight. I've, 
Mm, it's about six. Is it? Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, it's too much. So if too, you did six all in one hit, it would probably be efficient. But yeah, what, what yeah, happens yeah, is yeah. we're just doing this the whole time, and it yeah. just it. Anyway, uh, my nephew James, our nephew James has joined us today, Catherine and I. Hello, James. Hello. You can be on camera in a minute. Um, James, your, is, voice has, your voice has dropped like three octaves since the last time I saw you. Yeah, the last yeah. time I saw you was like when I was sick, I reckon. Right, okay. <laughs> Come and say hello, James. It was really high. And now it's Come around. and say hello. Man star. Hello, this is James. This is James. He's, uh, he's off school, so he's, he's come to see us. And he's uh, vastly going towards the ceiling, as you can as you can Just see. Not, yeah, yeah, duck down, James. Duck down. <laughs> there you go. There you go. There you go. Is that about right? That's about right. James has been helping us out with a few things today. Yeah. Thank you, James. Thank you, James. Um, so, that, yeah, James is with us today. Even James has said he's given up Instagram. Too much scrolling, right? Yeah, yeah. Kieran Jones says, watching TPS on my phone. Uh, I know. We can't do without them. It's, it's crazy to suggest we can do without them. Uh, Amadeus. Any experience with uh, Eastman guitars, Dan? I've got an SB56 Gold Top Reserve. Um, the only Eastman guitars that I've played, I think we were in Germany. We played a couple. Yeah, possibly. Uh, uh, Toman or somewhere. Yeah, they're really good. They are great. They've improved like really, quite a lot just yeah. over the last few years as well. Right. Um, I, I would call him a friend, except I've only seen him about three times in the last ten years. A guy called Pepin. Um, who's a lovely guy and a truly fantastic singer. He's the distributor for Eastman Guitars. Pepin. Pepin, yeah. It's P-E-I-J-P -E and some more J's. Wasn't that the name of the ends. dog in, in Jaws? The guy didn't, was walking on the beach goes, Pepin! Didn't know Pepin. that. Pepin! And then the lonely bit of uh, branch sort of floats up against into the... Uh, yeah. Did the, dog, did the shark eat the dog? Oh, yeah. Oh, no, Pepe, and I think it's... Uh, it wasn't um, real. Uh, uh, it's just a movie. What's the point of it if it's not real? This is my problem with fiction. Um, <laughs> what is the point if it's not real? What is the point? Um, uh, Pepe is a, a, a Dutch name, I think. Okay. Yeah. Probably means Stephen. I have just turned the super chats off because we've got loads, um, and seeing as we've started badly, we ought to get on really. Right. Uh, anyway, hello to uh, everyone. David Burke says he chewed the pooch. High five! High five well done, David. David. There you go, mate. Hope you're doing all right, mate. Um, <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> That's very good. <coughs> yeah. Uh, Scott from Baltimore is on. Richard. Richard Pribbenow. What a fantastic name. Pribbenow. If like, um I wanna I wanna think that Pribba is a verb. No, it should but he needs like the third after it. Richard Pribbenow the, the third. third. Yeah. 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 It's like, being introduced at Eaton. When are we gonna Pribba? Let's Pribba now. <laughs> All suggestions. Did you to, Pribba? Yeah. Please if you Half know, an hour ago. If you know what Pribbering is, please let us know. Richard, you especially. Uh, and Josh Raj is on. Lots of people, lots of friends. Thank you so much for joining us. At which point we should gallop. Oh, I didn't get the coconuts. It's very good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. We should oh, uh, dear. gallop to the super chai. Um, groovy. Oh. Don't you just love a blank screen, Dan? Oh, no. I do love blank screens. I should um, throw this across the room. Ed, Ed Airfire says, I considered an Eastman Junior Star for a long time. Yeah, no, they're, they're, I was impressed, actually. They're, they're really good. Yeah, yeah. Really, really, really nice guitars. They when, do, so they, like most guitar companies, they do some at, at kind of, you know, affordable, and then they do affordable plus. And then they do relatively unaffordable. Okay. Um, and obviously the relatively unaffordable ones are the ones you want. Nitro finishes, well, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Quite, yeah. quite, quite nice. Iron Wolf 1776 is first on this week. Hello, Iron Wolf. He says, I found the show on Friday very interesting. When I was dealing with the problem of extreme volume in my Blues Deluxe, the show was about Fender Hot Rod Deluxe and the Blues Deluxe was its predecessor stroke uh, contemporary. Um, I replaced V1 and V2 with 
uh, 12AX7s with 12AY7s, I then started using the low gain input. Mm. So what came out of the comments on over the weekend was there was a whole load of really basic stuff that we just glossed over. Use the low input, changed it, V1, use a passive attenuator in the effects loop instead of an active one. So we're gonna, we are going to go over all those things it, it partly as a way of explaining why we glossed over them. Yeah, I think just to say, loads of people mentioned the, the valve thing and absolutely, it's a lower gain valve and it will reduce the input at that stage, but it's a, it completely changes the gain structure of the amplifier. Yeah. And one of the things that we were trying to do was keep a, the basic feel of the thing because when the amp is turned up, we both really like it. Yeah, a lot of people were saying, why the hell did they design it then if, if it doesn't work? And we're like, no, 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 it does work. Yeah, it, it does. It's it just, just doesn't work at 75 dB. Yeah. It so works at 102 really nicely. Really lovely, <laughs> really lovely. So that was the, the goal. I ordered one of those Dr. Watson things off eBay. Oh, cool. It's just two jacks and a volume pot yeah, on top. Right. So I'm interested to open it up and see if it is just the volume or whether it's got capacitor in there. Sure some sort of treble bleed circuit or some sort of circuit to, I don't know, I don't know what's in there or if it's just a straight passive volume pot. Okay, th th so that you can blend in the second channel. No, it sits in the effects loop. So it's literally a volume oh, pot in does the it? effects loop. Okay. Two jacks oh, right. with a box on the top and a volume pot. All right, okay. So uh, I ordered one of those and then, um, Something else. Anyway, so we will follow up with a more simple uh, approach to that and just see how we get on. Cool. Um, Whit Anderson. Woo. Woo. Uh, he says, good day from New Jersey. Informative and fun hot rod show. What is the primary driver for the difference in the character of effects loops? Is it the preamp? Is it the power amp? Or is it the effects loop components? Uh, I'm expecting you to say some form of all of the above. Much love from Woo. The, so it's like... There's a hundred different ways that you can design them. The, you know, more. It's it's as uh, it, as simple as complex as as you want it to be. Just explain what what an effects loop has to do. So the effects loop has to break the point between the preamp and the power amp. So the preamp is the part of the stage that takes your tiny tiny guitar signal and increases it to a point that the power amp can work with it. It has to drive a phase inverter and then drive the, the power section. So what happens is it is split before it gets to the power section. And then, you know, you can, uh, if you're, a good example is if you're using the amplifier to create your distortion your gain sounds by turning the preamp up you can then use that preamp signal into your wet effects your delays and reverbs and then send that back to the power amplifier instead of having delays and reverbs into the front of the amplifier and they become distorted you're using the distortion from the amplifier that goes into the, the delays and reverbs and then back into the power amp. We call that an effects loop. It literally loops from the preamp out to the, to the whatever and then back to the power amp. One of the main issues with certainly when they first started doing it, if you imagine you've got your amplifier and then next to it is, is a rack of effects and you're using cables this long. And a lot of the time that worked fine because the impedances, they're not, they weren't really designed to drive long cables. But when we started putting effects, you know, our, our wet effects on the floor and we're sending 30 foot of cable from the preamp, it can cause problems. Um, so some people designed the preamps to enable low impedance sends. Also, the level of the, the preamp is, is, is the big the one. That's the big one. So whether it's true line level or instrument level, you know, like my, I clocked my matchless at, at uh, 35 volts. And what's a normal effect loop, like less than a volt? Uh, well, no, it can be, 
four volts. Okay, is a is a cranking. So you you've got a component in. Well, you got you got one job is you need to send the signal. The next job is you need to recover it, and in within all of that, you've then got to drop the signal massively out of the preamp to go off to your pedals, and then make it up again when it comes back. And that's where the problem is. So if you're doing all of that, you're dropping the signal, making it up again. Something's got to do that. Is it a valve? Is it a bunch of transistors? What's what's going to do that job? What circuit are you going to choose? Exactly the same as reverb sending. Re recovery That's exactly right and it's fundamental to the tone of the amp so given that there's no standard way of doing it um you you come across different issues and and yeah you come across different issues and if you go back to the sort of genesis of all this when they were using cranked this comes on to your question in a minute rob um, when they were using crank marshals, but they wanted clean effects because originally that would have been done post right at the board, at the effects board, at the um, mixing desk. The the full signal of the amp would hit the mixing desk, and they would use a send off the mixing desk with an aux to create the reverbs and delays. Effects loop is a sort of a, a, a fudge at doing that within the amp itself. Yeah. And if you talk to well, we can't can't talk to Ed anymore, unfortunately. But you know the early pioneers of doing this, Van Halen. Even people like Landau, all the work he did with Bob Bradshaw, mm. with trying to get those devices to work with a cranked amp, is the problem. Yeah. And when you crank is the problem, which brings us on to Rob, Eagle Ray Rob's question. He says, thanks for asking my question about the challenge of effects loops and multi-channel amps. So Rob was saying, how do you get over that thing where you switch from the clean channel to the dirty channel? And because of the differences in volume, your effects... Uh, level might yeah. increase massively because you're yeah. hitting the effects device so much harder. Absolutely. And the answer I typed was do it how Andy Timmons does it, which is to have um, a, a volume, a, a, an expression pedal control the effect level in the pedal itself. So Andy's always riding the effect level of his delay, for example, bec exactly for the, the reason you, you mentioned. Yeah. So there's all these little fixes and workarounds, but if if... If the hope is go to any amp, plug in your board, expect it to work the same, it's just, yeah, it's a million miles from that, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, because it, fundamentally we're relying on the preamp, that, that part of the amplifier, to amplify the guitar or the, you know, the, the, the pre before the amplifier tone, right? So that's, let's say we don't have any pedals, we're plugging the guitar straight in. We're relying on, on the preamp and the way that that works to give us that sound, right? Mm. Whatever the preamp's doing. Yeah. And every amplifier is different. Every amplifier, is that, that's a voice different. And it might be that the way the preamp is working is that all the tone, all the sound is created in the preamp section, and the power-up section is just this lovely, big, wide-open thing, and all the power-up section is doing is amplifying the sound you're getting out of the preamp. Or... It might be that the preamp is designed to be super hot, like a Tweed Deluxe, slam the signal into the phase inverter and get your overdrive that way. So there are, you know, and everything in between. Mm. So then you get to that thing is like, well, what what signal am I actually sending out yeah. from the preamp? Yeah. So that's where it, yeah. Gets and tricky. that 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 tees into your question, Rob. And there's another question linked to this in a bit. The, yeah, Rob's actual question is. So, master volume before or after the effects loop, what would you prefer? Uh, In most amps, it's going to come before, isn't it? So, if you've got... Um, right. It's less about where the master, where the effects loop is and more about where the phase inverter is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, James, you can tap out at any moment, by the way. If you're <laughs> literally nodding bored, off in the corner. Just just yeah. James bless him is 13 and a half. Is that right? Just about, yeah. Just about, yeah, yeah. So uh he's probably losing the will right now. <laughs> um so master volume before or after effects loop. The thing if you've got a master volume that sits after the preamp, but before the effects send, then 
you're actually controlling the amount of level that you send for the preamp out. So that in itself is a problem yeah. because then you're really inconsistent with the level you're sending. Yeah, yeah. If what you're, if so, generally it'll be after the effects loop. Um, if you're saying after the phase inverter, or you know, so you've got a some amplifiers that actually control the voltage in the phase inverter and the power amp. That's how they, you know, post mm. phase inverter thing will work because you've got two separate signals there that you need to control, right? So if they just put the... Well, there's two things because one is where the phase inverter is and then what you're talking about is power scaling. Which... Yeah, or, um, yeah, attenuation. But you've got, if you've got the, the phase inverter, right? So you're splitting the signal, you're inverting the phase on one side so that you're getting this the up cycle on one pair of valves and the down cycle on the other. And if uh, when it hits the phase inverter, if you, I mean, there's a bunch of different ways to do it, but one of the things like on the Lazy J that, that Jesse does, um, he controls the voltage with that. So as opposed to trying to, you know, like having a dual gang pot and putting it on both sides, just control, pull, you know, pulls the voltage down. And that can be an interesting way to do it. It gives you, it still gives you some sag. Yeah. Pat, like, you know, it's not ex exactly. The, the, the sort of elevator pitch for it is, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, across the board. So yeah. the amp is cranked throughout like a Tweed Deluxe, like a 50 watt plexi, something like that, like a 100 watt plexi if you're a crazy person. If you're a legend. You can you can basically forget about effects loops. Absolutely. Because it's just not going to work. Unless you're using really good line level gear and you've you've done a lot of work on getting that signal in and out. And maybe it's a parallel loop and maybe you can control the send and the return and all that. But that's why they had all those problems back in the day and why they continue to have those problems. And it's why things like wet dry rigs exist. But if, you, if your amp is kind of just overdriving a bit and it's just on the edge and you use your pedals for overdrive and actually the master isn't super cranked, most of it's happening in the preamp, maybe there's some love from the phase inverter, maybe there's some love from the power section, but it's not like completely crunching, then it can work. Yes. And it works really well. But And again, it's one of the reasons Dan and I like single channel amps that are just on the edge because then all of the problems go away. You can run everything in the front no no worries it all sounds great indeed uh no biggie but yeah it is um it's not a new problem they've been struggling with it ever since gain and amps and yeah Sab Sab oh, Sabadius. that's one and he sent me a lovely message this week hi dan the brand is sabadius sabadius sabadius, sabadius. There you go. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Nico. See you later, James. Yeah. I think we're having off. some sort of spaghetti item for dinner. Maybe with some meatballs. Oh, um, nice. Good. Right. We need to run up. We need to hurry up. Uh, Ed Airfire is on. Uh, Gordon Rankin says, if you modify the voltage into the output stage, you lose that cranked sound unless yeah. it's clipping before that. Yeah, yeah. It comes, yeah, yeah, of course. And it's... that's the sound you're looking for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Marmaduke Winterbottom Botham, Winter Botham says how can I get a good overdrive sound from my strats I always use humbucker guitars on my gigs uh, despite trying various overdrive pedals my strats just don't sound good when driven stick with your humbuckers Marmaduke if you, if, if you can't make it work stick with your humbuckers I'm the opposite I struggle with overdrive sounds from my humbuckers you sound pretty good on the Les Paul uh, but the strats I like because they sound thinner they got endless headroom and they suit my playing style better. Yeah. But there's a lot of people for who that's just not the case. Sure. Um, if you like a thick, fat overdrive sound of that particular variety, then a humbucker is kind of a must. But to be honest, if you if you've got some decent drive going, like I don't know what, like a full tone O C D, uh J Rocket H R M something that's got some goodly gain in it mm. and you hit that with a tube screamer oh happy days i'm struggling to see how that doesn't sound big and fat and 
sustainy and yeah, all of those things. But everyone's doing it. it's about how you play, isn't it? it is ultimately what it is. Um, you know, listen to Landau on a strat, even though he has been using more humbuckers recently. But listen to him on a strat. Listen to Philip Sace on a strat. Oh, listen to John Mayer on a strat. He gets pretty good gain sounds from a strat. Philip's coming in, isn't he? Uh, I haven't organised it, but yes, I hope he is. Okay, I need to. I need to get on that. Be wonderful to see him. Um, it really would. It really would. Uh, Scott Gaylor, I had my '68 Plexi modded to add an effects loop. It killed the tone of the amp. There you go. Yeah, that is fascinating. Yeah, and that isn't the first time I've heard that. No. Look, we get asked this all the time. The effects... uh, at least once every video, someone says, "Are you using the effects loop?" You go straight in. We have used the effects loop in the past for certain things, but 99.9% .9 of the time, we're, we're straight in the front. Yeah, with an amp that's just on the edge. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's a harmonically enjoyable place for us personally. Indeed. The effects loop giveth, and the effects loop, loop taketh, taketh away. away. <laughs> thus saith the right. Lord. Right, <laughs> we need to hurry up. Airfire, Ed, hello, mate. He says, <laughs> bank account abuse to heal the soul. It was a great week for me with a Supro Coronado and a vintage V120. Interestingly, amp tone at two, great for the P90, but too bassy for the strap tones. Fun exploring. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's, that is interesting. And that's quite common that you'll need to tweak things between guitars. Um, you know, one of, one of my big challenges when I was looking for a Les Paul, I wanted to do that as little as possible, so I needed something that was bright enough to sit with the tellies still sound like a Les Paul, but had a had an edge to it. When I found um and bought the guitar of Paul Stacy. But it is it's definitely a thing. I remember playing with Dave Gregory and on the match list you've got the the capacitor array, basically the different levels of bottom end. And for every guitar he'd plug in, he'd have the perfect notch position for that guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um uh, Marmaduke is saying, yeah, he uses the, the DNM drive and a Ryra, um, and yeah, just it just might not be to your liking, Marmaduke, you know. Um, uh, and I guess that's that's the way it is. Um, Fry at Power Station is a better way to add an amp, uh, add an effects loop to an amp that does not have one, says Rob F or even a vintage amp. I agree with one caveat, Rob. You are replacing the power section in the amp, kind of, because you're. If, if you use, let's say you use that power station on the end of your Marshall, you're then essentially subject to the 6L6s in the power station rather than the EL34s in your Marshall. Yeah, but you're still driving the EL34s, but yeah. you're just taking the output of that and then amplifying, amplifying the 6L6s. It a bit more. Yeah, so it does, it changes everything, like we said. Mm. Giveth, taketh away. Everything. There's no such thing as a free... Crunch. Come on! Get out of town. Come on! That was just brilliant. Thomas Gellner. Hello, Thomas. He says, uh, I became a Patreon today. An ordered new merch. I've watched for years. I rarely do super chaps, but the show has helped me so much. Uh, especially 10 ways to use a delay, just to name one show. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Thomas. That's very kind of you. Uh, yeah, we sort of, we try not to bang on about it too much, but, but stuff like uh, Patreon, the store, that's how TPS stays afloat. Um, we don't take any money off manufacturers. Most people know that, but some people don't. We don't do any product placement and we don't get paid for any videos. So um, <laughs> we're broke. <laughs> so doing it, doing it the other way means that we can um, be completely independent. And by buying merch, that's what you're doing. You're uh, supporting the show in that way. Yeah. And we appreciate that all this, some of this stuff looks insane, but most of it's personally owned, not owned by a pedal show from uh, previous exploits. Anyway, uh, Andy Roy. Gentlemen, no question, just a totally inadequate thank you for the encyclopedia of tone knowledge that you and your team and guests have brought to us over the years. Love your work. Ah, oh, 
Thank you, mate. That's Thank you, lovely. Andy. That's super kind of you. Um, for the last year or so, I've been playing with a brown face Princeton, says Jakob Van Cura, or maybe even Van Sura. I don't know. It's a C with a, like a circumflex on it. A circumflex? Actually, it's a... N no, it's not a circumflex. It's the little... N the n the little sideways S, whatever okay. that's called. Circumflex is a little triangle. Right. You see it in French. This is a little... What's it called? Come on, someone help. Anyway, Van Van Cura. He says, hi, says Jacob or Jacob. Uh, for the last year, I've been playing with a brown face Princeton. I've been very happy. Recently, I found it is not sufficient for outside venues. A bigger mm. amp will finally go wet dry with a second small amp. Thank you. Go wet dry. Great question. Go, yeah. If the wonderful thing about and I would possibly if you're using do you say Princeton? Yeah. But a brown panel one. Is that ten inch or twelve inch? Ten. Okay, so if you if you love the sound of that and you can get another if you love the sound of the ten inch one and you can get another one and go wet dry with it. The beautiful thing about it is you retain the sound that you love, but it's bigger and fuller, spreads better, will work better outside. But as soon as you, if you're outside and you stop the reflections, you can cut your, it basically cuts your volume by three quarters. I would never forget experiencing this playing in a massive tent I thought I've told the story before, but we we're doing the Young Farmers, Young Farmers gig, and I had my AC30, and that's a you know that gets lovely and you know cranky, and I've never really had any issues with the volume of that amp, even at big venues. But doing this outside thing, hardly knew it was on, and had just like this amp just isn't strong enough to do this outside gig. Um. So by having another amplifier, you're basically, you know, doubling the amount of power that you've got on stage. I think it's a great way to do it. Yeah, I'd go that way as well. Especially if you've got something that just had a tiny bit more headroom. Yeah. So you could, the Prince, as he just said this, the Princeton's doing all the stuff you love it for, but the amp with just that little bit more headroom is giving you the, the punch, if you like. Deluxe. Yeah, Deluxe Reverb. Deluxe and the Princeton. Even a Hot magic. Rod, actually, yeah. would do a great job. Um, yeah. Uh, even a pro junior, a pro junior would do a pretty decent job. And use the use the the Princeton as the wet amp. You might even get more headroom out of the pro junior. Really? Because of the way the the Princeton deals with bass. Oh, that's interesting. They do fart out very quickly in the bottom end of Princetons. That's interesting. Yeah, I, it maybe maybe not. Um. Andreas F says, can you get an EU merch store? I don't want to deal with Brexit. Um, Andreas, depending on where you are in the EU, most EU territories now, we have something called an IOS scheme. So what happens is when you buy from that pedal show store, the UK VAT is deducted and the VAT in your home nation is added. And there'll be no import charge as long as the uh, order is under 150 euros, something like that. Um, no customs, no mucking about. So it should be... Easy peasy. It's taken us over two years to sort out, but it is now in place and working. So orders to the EU, with the exception of a couple of countries, and I can't remember which ones they are, probably Switzerland. Oh, it's, it's Brexit is the gift that keeps on giving. Yes, uh, but for orders under a certain amount, you're covered. You can just buy, um, you'll pay the standard VAT for your nation and not British VAT, uh, and there'll be no import crap as far as i'm aware the hang the bag on the lower peg it does explain it all on the that pedal show store site yes um did paul show you the new prst style guitar when he visited paul reed smith this is uh if so any thoughts says rhino jam he hinted that there might be something but that was it that wasn't what was in the bag no there's a flying v in the bag <laughs> They're calling it the PRV. It's quite interesting. The PRV? Yeah. The Paul Reed V. Wicked. 
<laughs> but the the the, the is back to front. So you strum on this side. <laughs> I, I don't know. I I don't want to offend Paul or Gavin, who is my friend, who is the distributor. But man, that is not a good looking guitar, is it? Do you think? What's that? The PRS Miles Kennedy. I in in all honesty, I haven't seen it. Let me have a look now. It's the T style guitar they were talking about, right? And that could just be like familiarity. You know, I I do happen to think that the the Telecaster is among the most beautiful things ever created. Yeah. So it's a dual humbucker. I... But look at the body shape. Yeah, I know. I know. It's That's hard. Um, it, yeah, I, it's, not, it's not, not something that I could... Aesthetically, it just it looks off to me, but, yeah. uh, you know, that's that could just be a familiarity um, issue because we're so used to seeing the classic designs. Well, hang on, what's this PRS NF53? Well, that, presumably that's... That looks like a Pacifica. Yeah, so that's obviously the... Is that the same? No. It's a different body shape again. I think it's the same body shape. No, it isn't. Unless it's a weird photo. I... Th Ooh... I think it might be the same body shape, but it's just looks. Oh, that mm, no, you might be right. Okay, answers on a postcard. That looks better. The the top horn looks different. Yeah, looks deeper. Is but it, different? it looks more like a Pacifica. Yeah, like the Mike Stern. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, Rhino Jam. No, he didn't. He didn't show us. Um, and interestingly, they didn't send us one. So I think. They probably got a vibe when they were here. You got that vibe, Paul Reed Smith got that vibe. Uh, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. Runs there. D and M and B and H and K and R and we'll add and J today for James. Um, in the US working today, so I won't be able to catch the live. Just wanted to send love and appreciation to you and the fantastic TPS community. Thank you, Ran. Thank you, buddy. We hope you're enjoying your time working in the US and you're neither washed away with rain or baked with sun. Uh, Wim Jacobs, or even Wim Jacobs, or Vim Jacobs. Vim Hoff, remember him? I do remember Vim Hoff. The cold dude? Yeah. Yeah. Well, not cold. I've, I've... He was always warm. Yeah. He, he's he got some, like, amazing amount of world records mm. where he's, like, done the base camp at, at uh, Everest basically naked. Yeah. You know, and he's just happy. Walking Did you watch around. the TV show? I watched a bit of it. Yeah, yeah. It's so funny. Uh, anyway, uh, Vim or Wim Jacobs says, Hi, DNM. I use a TC hypergravity compressor mm. on my plethora, mm. but I want knobs. Uh, I've got room for a mini pedal only. Tips on how to choose. Wampler Ego Mini, Keeley Mini, JHS Exotic or whatever. I'm playing a Sire H7. Um... I don't know what the hypergravity is. Hypergravity is the there's a there's a multiband compressor from TC. Yeah. So are we going to say the um, Wampler Mini Ego then? They're all great. The, um, they're all fantastic. The Mini Ego. If I had to choose out of that bunch, I'd grab the Mini Ego. Uh, the the exotics really good as well, but the the mini ego gives you a little bit more control. You've you've got the 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 exotic gives you three levels of squish basically, and you know it's perfect. But I think the mini ego just gives you a little bit broader. Um, yeah, and it's a really really fabulous sounding compressor. So that's that's what I would grab from that lot. Yeah, it also has the. Um, it also has a blend control, which you've also got on your hypergravity. As far as I can see, and please correct me if I'm wrong, the Keeley Mini compressor does not have a blend. It has level and comp. Two knobs. The Keeley Mini compressor. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm just looking at a picture of it here. Right. Um, so if you use that blend, and the blend. We yeah we don't have a Keeley Mini. 
comp. Or do we have the Wampler? I was just looking at a picture of it. It does have a blend. Okay. Does the Wampler have a blend? Yeah, that's what I just said. Sorry, you said the Keeley. No, we don't have the Keeley. We do have the Wampler. Okay. And the Wampler has, has a blend. blend. Okay, great, yeah. great. That's important because if you use the blend, what it means is um, it blends in some of your dry signals. So if you like quite a bit of compression on the back end of the note, for example, for sustain, but you don't want to lose it on the front of the note, you can dial in quite a bit of your dry signal. That way you keep the punch at the front of the note, but you benefit from the sustain of the compressor. The Wampler has that, your hypergravity has that, the Keeley Mini doesn't. Right. The SP does. So the Keeley Mini, I'm assuming, is a straight take on their original two knob compressor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. Yep. And I must say, I really like those compressors. I love the uh, the dinosaur, um, the dinosaurus. No. Dinosaurial? The, no, the... Dinessa. Uh, the Dinessa from... The Dinessa. From... Uh, Jam. Jam, yeah, yeah. Jam. That's my favourite two-knob compressor. Yeah. It's just awesome. Because if I want less compression, I'll turn the compression down. You know what I mean? I I still love the sound. It's And it's a it's a sound. Yeah. But I love that sound. You like that, I don't you? I want the compression. yeah. I'm the opposite. If anything messes with the front... Because Dan's quite an attacky player and he uses a telly with quite a lot of transient, I think that's one of the reasons you like compressors. I'm the opposite. The front of all my notes are quite round. So the last thing I want is is for that to be messed with anymore. Indeed. I'd rather have it on the back end, as it were. Yeah. Madam. Uh, Mickey DTI7. Sorry. I am becoming increasingly fascinated by all of that, actually. It, there's nothing new in saying it, but just how different me and you sound using exactly the same guitar and exactly the same rig. Well, when we're doing the, the jam with jam, jam with jam jam, and then you put my telly on, you sounded like you. You sounded just like you. And I'm like, man, my guitar's amazing. And then I get up and play, I'm like, no, I'm still a bit crap. <laughs> but it's like, but it's still, it's like you do that thing we where sound you like go, ourselves. you go, and you make this massive note. And I'm like, yeah, Mike, it's awesome. Yeah, well, we sound like ourselves, you, don't yeah, we? And that, totally. that is to be celebrated rather than worried about because it gives you your sonic signature. But I am, I'm, I, I remain fascinated by just how big the difference is. Yeah, yeah, totally. And that between me and Dan, between Dan and you, between you and Andy Timmons, between Andy Timmons and Dan. You know, I, I'm, yeah, I, I, more time spent thinking about that is uh, is worthwhile, I think. Yeah. Or at least more time optimising that to to get you to where you want to be. Uh, Gordon Rankin says, players with the same guitar playing the same rig, no null knob changes. <laughs> yeah. Massive sound change. Always yeah. surprises me. Yeah, totally. yeah, yeah. yeah. I wonder what the settings are. I wonder what the settings are. <laughs> um, Mickey DTI7. Mickey DTI7 says, Great show on Friday. I'm guessing the underliner in the effects slope won't work with my Marshall, which has a pre phase inverter. Absolutely will work with it. Um, especially great with pre phase inverter. I mean, it just, it, it'll work with any effects like yeah let's try and explain this then maybe gordon can wade in here i sort of semi understand it every time someone draws me a diagram and then not after that in certain famous amps you have a pre phase inverter master volume and a post phase inverter master volume mm -hmm. the preamp hits the phase inverter mm -hmm. or it hits the master volume yeah exactly so if your amp and a lot of marshals are this way post phase inverter master volume did he say pre or post phase he inverter? says pre right. but i think he might mean post 
Okay. So if it is a post phase inverter master volume, uh, generally what the post phase inverter master volume is, is turning down the voltage to, to bring the level down. Otherwise it's a dual gang pot. And I mean, there's a, there's a few different ways to do it, but generally you're, you're turning down the, the voltage on the things, the anode of the, of the, um, the phase inverter. So what's happening there is that the preamp is smashing into the phase inverter, giving you all your lovely gain tones, and then you're turning down from after that. If the effects loop is Forget the effects loop for a second. If the master volume is before the phase inverter, yes. that means the more you crank the master, the more the phase in inverter gets pushed. Gets pushed. If it's the other way around, not so much. If if yeah, but see, the circuit, the master volume circuit is different. It's not just where it's placed. Yeah. But the master volume is doing a, a different thing. Yeah. Um as I understood it, post phase inverter volume post phase inverter master volume amps are more problematic with effects loops. That's the way I'd always yeah. understood it. They and, and the reason being is you are because you if you if you imagine that as you turn down uh it's like a voltage control um making the valve stage less efficient yeah and easier to to clip to limit then anything that's in the effects loop is going to clip it's the same thing that if you've got an effects loop with a non-master volume amplifier and it's cranked and it's smashing into the phase inverter, the effects loop is pointless anyway. Mm. The, the best effects loops are big, clean power sections that can take stuff from the preamp. You Have a look at the way um, Dave Friedman designs a preamp. And the send is a genuine instrument level send low impedance it's beautiful and then he does the uh, a, a really clever um sort of what do you call it the, the re recovery recovery on the uh, uh, return it's great but all of that gain and everything is 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 all done in the preamp if you took the the gain from a tweed deluxe and you just look at the preamp signal, it's clean. Yeah. But it's massive. Yeah. And it's that big, clean, massive signal that's smashing into the phase inverter that gives you that drive. So that drive isn't created by just the preamp. And that's where it all gets really complicated. Yeah. Gordon concurs. Master volume is usually pre-phase inverter. Yep. That's why it specifies a P P I M V, which is incidentally Simon uh Kingsley, Simon Jarrett's name on Instagram, isn't it, I think? Right. <laughs> Which is why they normally specify post-phase inverter master volume and not pre-phase inverter master volume, because as Gordon points out, that's the far more common scenario. Yeah. Um, as Dan is saying, the post-phase inverter requires a dual gang volume pot. Posts are always high volume and more problem problematic for most pedals. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, so what will happen... If you've got a post-phase inverter ma uh, master volume and, you know, with the effects loop and you've got something like the underliner in there changing the level, you'll be changing the amount of signal that's going into the phase inverter creating that distortion. So instead of just getting a level change, you're actually getting a, a limiting, a, like gain change. Which could be exactly what yeah, you yeah. want. Because then you've got clean crunch and balls out by doing it in exactly. that way. And the, the thing about, you know, having that much headroom um, in in the underliner was specifically so, I mean, so I use it with my matchless in the loop. And when I turn the matchless up, because the matchless is like, it's very much about that relationship with the, you know, the power stage and getting it warm and lovely. Um, and having a, a couple of different levels controls that sort of amount of limiting and the amount of signal that's hitting the, the power stage. And it's another way to do it. You could put, 
you could do it with a uh, like a passive volume pedal but then you've got an impedance issue from the output of the volume pedal because it changes depending on where the volume pedal is set so if you then buffered from the output of the volume pedal um yeah there's a, i mean a number of different ways you can do it but yeah. yeah there you go and just to make the point that if you're um if you're not driving your amp much after the preamp so if you've got if you're creating a bit of overdrive from the preamp so so be it if the amp isn't cranked, none of this is really a problem. If it's not overdriving in a big way, none of this is really a problem. You can run everything pretty much either in the front or in the loop and everything will be fine. The problem only comes when you've got that master section cranked Yeah. with effects loops. So yeah. if it's not cranked, don't worry about You're it. You're okay. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Very yeah. good. Very good. Um, Gary H. Hello, Gary. He says, no question. I just want to say thanks to DNM for the incredible amount of education and entertainment you've provided. Invaluable and inspiring. Keep doing what you do and being authentically you. Oh, thank you, buddy. Thank you, Gary. That's very kind of you. Uh, Dave. That's a, that's, that's a lovely thing, actually. The... If you can. Actually, in fact, we all can. If you're brave enough to. If you have the courage to. It takes a while. Yeah. Takes your whole life, at least. And that feeds into everything. It's a conversation that I, ha I had with Paul Stacey for years and years. And one of the reasons he is where he is musically is that he had the courage to do it. Mm. I just, I remember seeing him at the six. I've seen him at the 606 half a dozen times. And every time was a wildly different experience. And there'd be one night where he sounds like a cross between... Charlie Parker and Holdsworth and the next night he'll sound like Albert Lee mm. it's like well you know and and it from from phrase to phrase yeah 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 and <laughs> and one night there's solo and he's like just played a note and and it's like it's cool I said yeah that's all I had to say at that point <laughs> and it's like I just, I love that. I love that approach. It's like, this is what I'm feeling now at this moment. I'm going to play that. Beautiful. Yeah. Courage. Courage, courage, courage. courage. Dave Oshman. Hello, Dave. Dave Oshman says, hello from Houston. Uh, it's a new old amp day. I was showing a new SG special to a friend. The only amp I had to plug into was my bass rig, a Fender 100T, a modern bassman. Now I need a new bass rig as this is my new favourite guitar. Right? Come on. I love that. <laughs> we, we've got an old silver panel um, Bassman 70 up there, which is a bass amp, and it sounds flipping great as a guitar amp. Wonderful. I think it actually does a better John Mayer sound than my two rock. <laughs> uh, Jacob Backer. Hello, Jacob. He says, or Jakob Backer, we're not sure. Uh, he tells us every week, every week I forget, in, out. Uh, Check dear, it all about. Dear DNM, I love the show on Friday. Alas, no effects loop here. Do you ever feel like sculpting a sound is awesome, but when in coming to play music, it's only a sum of its parts? I keep losing myself to the first. That's a brilliant question. So he's saying, spend ages sculpting a sound. Good, you love the sound. And then when it comes time to play music, record, play with the band, it's kind of... Surplus to requirements, because does it work? Yeah, it's one of the it's one of the things. If you think of classic guitar setups, and let's say a uh, treble booster into an AC thirty. If you stand in front of an AC thirty, there's nothing going on except a treble booster into a cranked AC thirty. It's a hard sound to stand in front of and listen to. Do you know what I mean? And you've listened to it as, as much as anyone. But it's, there's, it has such an edge. It is so abrupt. And it's like, why would anyone choose that guitar sound? But it's, it's when you hear it in context and what that sound enables you to do what that sound, how it resonates with the guitar at that volume. Because, you know, the amp has to be loud for it to work. But it's a sound that's like, it amazes me that 
you, like you'd never just be playing around with your AC30 and go, oh, I know what I need. I need yeah. a bunch more treble. But it's because artists were, were playing with bands and it's like, and people started hitting he- heavier. It's like, I'm, I'm, I'm losing the edge. I'm, I'm too, what, what can I yeah. do? Let's just, let's just pump a whole bunch of treble into it. See how it goes. You stick a bunch of loud musicians and that is like, it is dreamy. Yeah, yeah. It's such a great sound, isn't it? It's such a point? great sound. It depends what you do, doesn't it? If you spend your playing time creating sounds and, I don't know, maybe doing a bit of recording or even not that, just enjoying the sounds, then all good. If you sit that on that line between creating the sounds and enjoying that, but you've also got a regular gig, you will know only too well the, mm. the different worlds that those two things are. Because the gig requires something different, and that's okay. I don't necessarily think there's a an either or situation. Perhaps the sum total of the learning is you get to understand what's going to work and what's not going to work, and you know what's what to apply and what not to apply. Mm. I think it's a a wonderful topic, though. What are the elements that's important? If I think Mick and I are really fortunate in that we have done. We spent decades doing loads and loads and loads of gigs, and it's a really wonderful experience. But if you haven't done that, and you you know you might do a couple of gigs a year, those gigs are really important. It's yeah. it's they're, they're real moments. How do you set things up they, they, to get the most out of them? It can be a really dispiriting experience as well because your expectation yeah. of what you've been listening to for ages has been this you know, relatively high fidelity. You can hear everything that's going on the second the drummer starts, the second the bass player cranks up and God forbid you've got a second guitar player, you're buried and they're buried. So it's, you then really have to start working together as a team to sculpt a sound that's going to work for everyone. Yeah. It's hard. It is hard, but it's a great, it's a great topic. Yeah. And I think the, 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 the discipline and the learning and the skill comes with doing it enough where you realise volume isn't the problem. Yeah. I'm a passionate advocate of this. Absolutely. Yep. Volume isn't the problem. It's you're either not playing as an ensemble well together or you're not using the volume appropriately. Yeah. Doesn't mean necessarily that it's too loud. It's like it's too loud here with yeah. the wrong frequencies. Yeah. There you go. But when it comes time to be heard, and we talk about this a lot, can't tell you how many bands I've seen relatively recently where the guitar player takes a solo and I just can't hear it. So that's, it is one of my, it's not even a pet peeve. It makes me just a, a pop, a, 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 what am I, the, a, 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 um, the word I'm looking for is apoplectically angry. Yeah. <laughs> right. I go and see a band and the singer, I can hear the vocal and I can hear the kick drum and the guitar loud in certain sections and then goes to take a solo. You might be lucky if the, if someone turns the solo up in the last couple of notes, then goes back to the rhythm part. Guitar's too loud now for the rhythm part. And that this is in... In response to this was part of the thing behind the underline because I, when it's time for the solo, on, like on a record, solo comes in and it sits alongside the vocal. It's a this melodic thing that happens to support and, and colour what's going on melodically with the vocal. I mean, part of the problem with, um, it's not really the death of the guitar solo, but there's a you know, certainly in pop music. You know, when you go, when I go out to gigs and I can't hear what the guitar player has spent so long trying to get under his fingers, and I can't hear him, it's like yeah. heartbreaking. That's when all those hot rod deluxes that everyone's saying they're too loud and Fender's <laughs> obviously designed it wrong come into their own because you can hear yourself yeah, loud and clear. There you go. There um, you go. Admar Herman's. Uh, he's saying Pepe's Dutch. Don't get me going because ignorance has always been the UK's Achilles heel and why the UK had its stupid Brexit. Pepe's Italian. Get it together, folks. OK. Admar. It's spelt P-E-P-I-J-N like Pepe Linders, the Dutch 
Dutch football manager. So head out of your ass, please, and listen. <laughs> Not the spelling of people's names. Thank you. God, it makes me... Oh, I know. The internet's been driving me mad this weekend. People are so fixed in their motivated understanding of things. There is a catastrophic collapse in... I'm just going to stop. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. I've got to quite a good place in recent years. You have. With not being annoyed by this stuff. Mm. Has there been an event that's pushed it over the edge? Um, or has it just been accumulative? Well, it's usually a moment of, of self-realisation that you've got something wrong. So we got the Hot Rod Deluxe video wrong. We we missed all the obvious stuff. We didn't but do what? the... We didn't do the... Um, V1 tube. We didn't do. Well, hang on. But that there wasn't. That was really obvious stuff. We didn't do the second input. A lot of stuff that people do. We 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 glossed over it and we missed it. And that that would be the source of my annoyance that we just got it a bit. Yeah, but I. But see, I would have said that that wasn't the point of the video. The it point wasn't... of the video was that was okay. It's loud and it sounds great. How do we get that vibe? So when you when you do that and. This is sort of part of the problem. So people will grab onto that and then point out that you've missed all this stuff. And it's like, we, we should have just covered it briefly because we just were like, this isn't what this video is about. Oh, okay. But however, we should have mentioned it. We so should, it starts okay. there with right. a kind of, Dolt, I've, I've dropped the ball there. And uh, 200,000 people are going to jump up and down on that ball for the whole life of this video, which is quite annoying because you do have to rather spell it out. Fair enough. Which is fine. And then, so yeah, ultimately, it's always, you know, any any negativity, any um, anger, any resentment, all of that are all, they're all internal. That doesn't happen to you. They're all, they're all about your own, you want to be angry. Yeah. You want to resent. You you're want choosing to, it. You want to feel the negativity. Sure. But what you're doing is you're allowing that negativity to flow through you and you're reacting to it and you're reflecting it. Okay rather than doing what would be more useful for all humanity, which is to let conscious presence flow through you and to just essentially shine conscious presence on the negativity, at which point the negativity dissipates. It just goes away. Mm -hmm. So part of the annoyance for me would be that I've been connected to the negativity and I feel negative. Oh. Which is, that's just bad for everyone. Because then there's more negativity. Sure. But I, and then, then you start, then you get on the negativity horse and you start riding it around the negativity arena, right. waving to the negativity, negativity crowd. And I start thinking things like, why don't people think before they write a comment? Why, why is there an assumption? There's just an immediate assumption and attachment to a belief that if you just thought about it for 20 seconds in a critical thinking capacity, you would come up with a different solution. I'd just like to say hello to our podcast listeners at this point. Yeah, um, I am kind of interested. I sent down a text over the weekend. I said, I wonder if there's any courses or education in critical thinking. There must be. There must be. Because they should, they should... Philosophy or psychology? That's part of it. I mean, being able to think philosophically would help you to be a critical thinker. Yeah. But I'm not sure it would necessarily give the tools required to critical thinking because that also involves some logic, some yes. some understanding of logic and yep. premises. Yep. And you know things like false dichotomies and all of that kind of stuff. But of course, again, not to be uh, political or uh, uh, in any way difficult about it, but there are a good many schools that simply could not and would not teach critical thinking for obvious reasons because it would batter their reason for existence in the first place anyway blah 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 i think we do yeah nice let's funk So the, the solution is to, instead of worrying about it and taking on all this negativity, is to just, it is what it is. Is what it is. It is what it is, and you don't have to jump on the negativity train. You can take a different train. So 
I just spent a few minutes on the wrong train. Let's put it that way. Okay. <laughs> anyway, maybe they'll turn the internet off. Um... <laughs> I say to Dan, I just, uh, I just, I feel like going to get in a job, like digging a hole in a road or doing, I don't know, something. Uh, not to suggest that that is any kind of lesser job, but it, it would uh, detach one from, detach oneself from the internet. Well, I used to um, do the, the building in Australia when I was um, sort of project manager doing the renovations, and I did that for years. I tell you what, being able to look back on the day and see what you've done, see that, you know, we've rendered a wall or we've, you know, built a veranda or whatever, man, it's so satisfying. And when you're outside working, it's a, yeah, it's pretty great. Yeah. It's knackering yeah but yeah it's yeah. pretty it's pretty great i don't know if i could i did a lot of that sort of stuff in my 20s i'm not sure yeah. i could do i don't think i could do don't it think i could do it these no. days my um, knees my knees hurt uh it's good i think there is i i am i am hopeful no i'm not hopeful i don't i don't hope anything uh i know that there is there are a growing number of people who are more tuned in to thinking differently. Okay. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. It might take another 2,000 years, but that's all right. Uh, Think about what my telly be worth then. <laughs> Play till it hurts, says uh, there's enough holes in the roads. No need for another one, Mick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, just going out randomly digging holes in the yeah, road. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is my new job. I did. I did. Uh, I was talking to Ainsley last week. He dug. He dug a massive hole in his back garden for a trampoline, and it was meters by meters. Right. I dug a hole about this big for a um, rhododendron bush, and the amount of soil that came out of a hole that big was really quite surprising. About that much. Well, because it no, because then it's not quite so compacted. It was about four or five IKEA bags worth. No, oh. those blue IKEA bags worth. Right. And uh, he stuck out this meters by meters hole by hand. I said, "You must got a, like a machine in to do it." Right. No, no machine. He'll have fun when it rains. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe the part trampoline part depends what the uh, yeah, depends what the drainage is like. I suppose. I decided that if Daddy, I I'm drowning on the trampoline. I'm not going to dig a hole that some other dude owns. If I own a hole, I'll dig it. If he owns it, I ain't digging it. Right. That's it. Dig it. <clears throat> Can you dig it? Oh, under worm. Um. Anyway. Uh. Chris says four thousand holes in Blackburn, Lancashire. <laughs> nice. Very good. That's a Beatles reference, right? Very good. Uh. Chris Quinn says, critical thinking, not in vogue right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, somebody quoted the Buddha, and you're absolutely right. Uh, you don't attach yourself to possessions, relationships, thoughts and emotions. Johnny Love. That is so unbelievably profound, Johnny. Uh, that um, identification with thought and form. That That's the beginning of enlightenment if you're interested mr timothy lurch joining us again good day yeah, mate yeah, yeah, yeah. critical thinking requires careful listening curiosity and respect for ideas other than your own yeah beautiful i'm liking it yeah beautiful thanks tim yes um good well hopefully uh jonathan burton thank you jonathan for saying that uh sorry and i apologize for my uh, outburst it's got to come out, otherwise it stays in. <laughs> uh, which reminds me, um, let's get on to uh, Stephen Harden. Hello, Stephen. Hey, gents, no real question. Just thought I'd say that after watching your show for a while now, I finally went and bought myself a hard-wired, hand-wired AC30. Sounds amazing. Oh, come on. Thanks for another great show. Come on. Glad you're enjoying that, Stephen. I see everything twice. 
says hi from Boston. New guitar week, but I'm afraid I've blasphemed. I've got a Shabbat T-shaped object with a humbucker and a P90. Bless me, Dan, for I have sinned. Thanks for all you do. Uh, say say twenty. <laughs> um, uh, hail Albert Kings. Hail Mary Cries. Albert Collins, <laughs> and uh, what's the other one? Um, Albert and Ernie. <laughs> I like the Shabbat guitars, really like them. A guy called RV makes the Shabbat guitars. They um, Jam had a bunch of them on their uh, stand at Oh, yeah, right. Really, really cool guitars. In other news, we are going to hit our first million view video this week. Looks like it, doesn't it? Mm. What are we up to now? 980 or something? 983. 983. Noel Gallagher hopefully is going to hit a million views. And seven years... And however many videos we've done, this will actually be our first million view video. <laughs> That's how boring we are. Yeah. This... That's one way to look at it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we've got lots of... Rick Beato's just got a blink and he gets a million views, hasn't he? Yeah. Rick, Rick Beato blinks. Yeah. Actually, we were on Rick's channel this week. He finally, he, I say finally, he got the video re-uploaded. There was a technical problem. So we're very grateful to Rick and thank you very much to Rick yeah. for posting that interview with us on his channel. That was, a, that was a, such a great day. Yeah. I really enjoyed hanging out with him. It's a big deal, that. Yeah, it was really cool. Really big deal. Yeah. Hmm. We but, also had the boys from Jam in this week. Ah, uh, so that's one thing I was going to say when you were mentioning about, you know, are you all playing together? All the guys from Jam are really great musicians. And when, when we jammed with Jam... One thing that was immediately obvious is that everyone was listening so intently to everyone else. It was really beautiful. Doing what um, Yanis does, and Yanis is like a experimental avant-garde producer of sounds. He's actually a really fine guitar player, so creative. And to do what he does, he's got to be so aware and ready to turn left at any moment and like watching you jam with him and he was on it yeah and he's if you amazing played a melody he was listening he was right there yeah yeah and then I, Ilias, I wasn't listening i was just going <laughs> and then and then Ilias would be grabbing stuff it yeah. was really wonderful it was so much fun it was good it was nice so yeah we did we interviewed yanni um about jam and some stuff we got him to do a little performance with his crazy pedal board. You will not believe it when you see it, including uh, item with springs, bits of metal, and other items that you excite, go through a piezo Brilliant. pickup, and then hit a bunch of reverbs and stuff. And then we jammed as a band, just Great. swapped the instruments around and jammed. It was really lovely. So fun. So that'll come out maybe maybe in a couple of weeks. Andrew Thorpe says... I watched the Null video 999,000 times. <laughs> Thank you, mate. <laughs> and Angus McLennan says, you're not boring, you're niche. It's, it, is, it is interesting that I remember when Ed was on and he said, you'd be really surprised who watches the show. Yeah. And you were you were genuinely surprised. I still am surprised when I meet people and they say I bumped into um, I was watching Paul Stacey play with with his brother and um, Jason Rebello and a bass player and a sax player whose name I can't remember but who are equally you know epic epic yeah. And um, dude walks up to me at the bar and says, "Oh hi Mick, uh, I was watching your show today." I was like, "Oh right," and he had earphones in uh, earplugs and he wasn't talking very loud, so I couldn't really hear him. I said, "Oh," after when they finished, well, let's have a chat outside. Um, and it was Ethan Johns, <laughs> who is like a mega producer. Check out Ethan Johns' um, credits. It's that scary. That is awesome. Yeah, yeah. He wants a pedal board. Well, let's do that then. Mm. That would be great. Yeah. But also, um, uh, guy from the Black Crows. Mark Ford. So when you were at NAMM, Nick yeah. sent me this text as like, Mark for coming to go, yeah, I'm a fan of the show. And you were like, no, you don't. Get out of here. Get out of here. <laughs> yeah, so you're in good company, people. Actually, they are in they good company. They are in good company. Let's, let's do that. Yeah. Um, so we don't think you've sinned. I see everything twice. 
Uh, those very nice guitars, those Shabbats. Raf Freitas, hi DNM. Have you heard of VHT D50? I'm intrigued. Don't believe I have. The only VHT I know is the Pitbull. I, I've, I've told this story many times, but I'll tell it again just for the halibut. I'd done a wedding gig with a VHT Pitbull and a casino. And I bet it was awesome. It was a bit feedbacky. <laughs> Good. The clean channel was amazing. They, they're really great. But literally every time I went onto the overdrive channel, it was like, Whoa! Brilliant. <laughs> uh, VHT D50. Hand wired on eyelet boards, two Ruby tubes, six L6s. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to like that. Nice. I'm going to like that, no doubt. I don't know what's happening with VHT. So VHT used to be owned by Steve Fryette, right? I think. Oh, okay. I think. Right. I think. Have I got that right? Um, oh, yeah, it's a Dumble. D50. Yeah, it'd be good to hear it. Oh, come on. You know it's a Dumble because yeah, it's got yeah. a rock and jazz switch. <laughs> rock. <laughs> yeah it would be nice to hear that raf um it's so funny you know we we again we've we've remarked on this a few times but those there's quite a few amps now that are that are you know overtly dumble inspired from two rock seria tone vht as you say um what's the other the really the one that mitch has got ah the Fuchs. Fuchs, yeah, Andy Fuchs. And various others. And what is quite interesting is that so few people have actually heard an Overdrive special up close. Yeah. Or at least had chance to AB it properly. It's always our sort of version of what we think those amps sound like. Because you can look at the schematic and all of that, and I'm sure you, that would get you close. But um, perhaps the best ones are going to be the ones who really know those amps well, who, who've who repaired them, who've been inside them, who spent time around them. Mm. I think Andy Fuchs probably has. but um, And then, of course, the recorded sounds that we hear from those amps are quite different from what the actual experience is. But they, all my experience of, of the best Dumble amps, and indeed Dumble amps, is they are hard work. Yeah. Really hard work. Yeah. Nothing easy about them. Because... Everything is exposed. Yeah. Everything is amplified to, with the most incredible clarity. And it's why the guys who have developed touch and dynamics love them because all that stuff that they've spent their lifetime working on mm. can be heard, um, which is, you know, which is great. There's, I think as you develop as a player and those sorts of nuances actually become part of what you know you you sort of recognize and become part of your personality on the instrument they're the things that you want to come out you know as opposed to just shreddy mcshreds and um it's the phrasing and the you know the the, the touch and that i think that's that's the dumble thing for me when you hear robin on a dumble i, I love him on the twins i think he sounds great in the twins just think him him on the dumbbells is like it just sounds so like Robin. Yeah. Know what I mean? It just it's him. Yeah. There's some really wonderful footage of him recording his last album. Oh nice. And he's there in the room with the dumbbell. Yeah. And he's just unleashing. It's <laughs> just awesome. It's really cool. <laughs> it's really cool. That it's that's it, the, the synergy of player and gear right which is what we're talking about because clearly tones all in the fingers not hearing anything you do need a conduit for it to sound there you go and and maybe this is a, a little thinking in logic where because it works for robin ford we assume it's going to work for us yeah there you go because it sounds good no he sounds, sounds good, good through it there you go beautiful and that's very easy to forget um that that might not work for you and it and it but that doesn't mean it's bad 
or better or worse or good. It means it requires 360 degrees of player gear and environment for good sound, well, for an enjoyable sound to, or whatever the word, whatever adjective you want to use, um, for the sound to occur. Mm. And that's why I say I found the Dumbles hard work, because I ain't Robin Ford. <laughs> yeah, but I, I I think that sort of tone does suit you. When I hear you play through the... Um, not not that the two rock is is the Dumble thing, but you know there are definitely elements of it there, and it is you know one of the best guitar sounds I've ever heard is you into that amplifier. When you're on, when you're on, it works. But coming back to the question earlier about you get these great sounds, how does that translate to music? That's the bit I've struggled with because the music that I've been playing recently, I've done a couple of gigs and I've got one next Saturday. That sound doesn't really work in that environment. Sure. So you're back to a different approach i have to say your telly although to be fair it was my two rock wasn't it it was the two rock it was the two rock and we had um, the ts1 no the guitar amp was my my amp where we had yanis through the ts1 oh okay right yeah 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 so we had um i think it was a double dreamer or a lucy dreamer supreme can't remember which yanis uh one of jam's double overdrive pedals i think mm. it was a lucy dreamer um, and a rattler, and a rattler, yeah, and delay lama, delay lama, and a monk, yep. And that's one of my favourite sounds I can remember having almost forever with your right. telly. Yeah, right. It was all the mids were right. There was yeah, enough yeah, gain. Yeah. Um, that was a that was a really enjoyable guitar sound. Yeah, it was so much fun. Um, anyway, blah blah blah. Uh, Todd Roy says, Robin Ford is playing his best right now. Mm. Every live clip I see of his shows are so good. I I would yeah. mostly agree. I think he's yeah. playing beautifully he really at the is. moment. He really is. He seems to be really um, motivated Yeah. to be doing it. Yeah. That's lovely. Um, Jeremiah McCann. Hello, Jeremiah. Nice to hear from you. He says, uh, I had a show at an emo night. In Frederick, Maryland, to a 400 plus person crowd. The only thing through the PA was vocals and kick. Your guidance on how to cut through a band mix helped me avoid hearing the dreaded I couldn't hear you at all statement. That's good. Lovely. Yeah. Lovely. I think if you've got an Ampeg SVT and a, at least a 50 watt guitar amp, you could be heard by 400 people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And a nice kit. The other thing that's very easy to. Um, underestimate is a loud stage does translate quite well through all the vocal mics yeah yeah so you definitely do get quite a bit of kit through the vocal mics yeah even though if you're using a dedicated uh you know vocal microphone which has quite a limited pickup pattern you still get i know when uh, we play together dougie has a particular kind of akg mic mm. which sounds pretty sensitive mm. those things you use and there's always loads of kit that comes through the, yeah. his vocal mic. Yeah, it's great. I really, and that that has a surprising effect. Um, yeah. Unless now on modern desks and with modern sound engineers, they might be using gates and stuff to stop that. But old school, I like that. Mm. I think that works really well. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I remember doing a session in, when I was uh, in my twenties in Sydney, and. <laughs> There was a, uh, with a drummer called Glenn Wilson, an amazing drummer. And I've been playing with him for years. And basically, the, the engineer, he'd been playing this thing, and the engineer had everything gated, like really full on. And Glenn was just an extraordinary, like sensitive, dynamic player. It's like, something isn't quite happening there what's happening it's just we turn the gates off for a second then all the ghost notes and everything there is just sort of like that's what it's meant to sound like <laughs> yeah, well the ghost was like poom, ga, poom, ga. yeah 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 <laughs> uh lee brimble hello lee hello, lee man. says leggings i have a bad cat cub my neighbor is selling his jtm 30 would this make a good wet dry rig uh with the marshall as dry i'm a cameraman for top gear 
Oh, come on. I want to praise your production and editing. That's it. Lee. Thank you for watching Pedal Show that, for all these years. I that, think we'll put a line under it there. That is among the highest compliments we've ever been played. It, but, but if you do live under a rock and you've never watched Top Gear, it has some of the highest production values in any normal telly. It's really wonderful. And by normal telly, I mean not Game of Thrones or you know Netflix throwing billions at it. It is just beautifully filmed and edited and is amazing so lee thank you for your work because it remains inspiring that's awesome yeah oh, yeah well done mate that's so oh good. that's good cheers buddy um anyway he says uh, is the jtm 30 a good wet, wet dry with his bad cat cup now am i right saying the jtm 30 is a three by ten or was that the 60 can't remember jtm 30 112 112 112 maybe it was the 60 that was a uh 310 um what what's the other app a bad cat cub yeah okay. I, th I think that would work great, yeah i think that'd be really nice so there, there is a 2 by 10 version or the 1 by 12 um yeah that i think that would work great and up to you which way round you run them um it might be that the marshall's got slightly less headroom than the bad cat the bad yeah but the bad cats are a really gainy amplifier is it yeah so i mean they've I guess it depends how you, you run them. All the bad cats that I've been involved with have really, really glorious, crunchy things to them. But I think they'll give out sooner than the Marshall. So I think the Marshall is the wet would be really nice. Yeah, yeah. I remember these amps. They were really good. Yeah, go for it. And, and just to sort of say, to be honest, as long as the gains aren't too vastly different... And that is another thing that you might want to try, but to when, just to get going, to, to start your wet dry journey, as long as the gain, the overdrive level in the two amps isn't vastly different, pretty much any two amps are going to sound good. Yeah. You do, well, just reiterate the basic advice, which is you do need to make sure whatever you're using to do the split is isolated so you don't get ground loop hum and is phase reversible because there's every chance those two amps will be out of phase with one another. Pretty easy to hear. Um, at anything other than minuscule volume. What I tend to do, what we do when we're setting up for playing is we'll play a bass note, flip the phase between the two amps and you can usually hit it, hear it pretty clearly. Yeah. Depending on where you're stood, it might not be so obvious. The second you record it, it's night and day. Yeah. No, uh, uh, no mistaking that. So yeah, you do need a device that will flip the phase uh, and that has isolation on the second output. Most good ABY pedals do that. Dan makes one called the AB Baby. The um, radial tone bone mm -hmm. ABY is pretty good. And Dan makes also makes a device called the Humdinger, which is designed specifically for this purpose. You can't switch between the amps. It's on permanently, but it is a problem solver and it's only yay big. So that's what I would recommend. If you come out, if let's say you've got a pedal with stereo outs, stereo reverb, stereo delay or whatever, um, or a wet and a dry output such as a Boss CE whatever, that can work. What will probably happen is you will get hum on one of the amps and it, there's a 50% chance one of the amps is going to be out of phase with the other. So, fair? Very fair. You can fix that by swapping the speaker terminals. <laughs> on the amp that's out of phase but better to just get it right at source indeed indeed we've got a um experience day happening this friday we do i'm exp i'm excited about it yeah i love our experience days yeah be good be really good uh i wonder if we set the same rig up or something different we set this rig up for uh experience days along with dan's rig this does a crazy wet dry wet insanity rig it's just amazing <laughs> uh -huh. just we, it's you know it's completely impractical but we need people to experience it yeah. it's just magic yeah yeah <laughs> s crawford music legends it's been too long since i caught you live have either of you ever owned a lap steel my first reverb purchase years ago was a non-functional uh oahu diana oahu i hope i've said that right uh, I'm just getting around to it now. Love from Boston, from Sam. 
Awesome. So my brother-in-law loaned me an old national lap steel from like the 30s. Oh, cool. It was painted orange with a Hawaiian hula dancer on the back. It was belonged to his great-grandfather, I think. He had no idea what it was. I had no idea what it was. And I remember going into... I don't, I don't think it's called Vintage and Rare, but it was a vintage guitar shop in Sydney and taking it in. And um, the guy behind the counter had a look at it and went, well, it's a bit rough. I don't really know if it's, you know, what it's worth or or if it's a, if it's an old one. Let's, let's have a look. And he pulled out this book. And there was a picture of the exactly cut F holes uh, because they're all done by hand. It's like... Oh, wow, this thing's worth a small fortune. <laughs> but so it came in this case and it had these steel blocks, like action like this, and there's little steel blocks. And and, and the, it, the sound that would come out of it it's was... Magic sounding. Things. Absolutely magic. They are magic. It's one of those things, isn't it? Like you probably periodically say to yourself, right, I'm going to get one and I'm going to put some time into it. Because it played simply with the right sound can be so effective. So 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 just effective. wonderful. And then you watch someone who can really really play them, and it's like ah okay, that is that's a whole other world. Yeah, I, mean, I did a demo on the Guitarist Mag channel when the Duesenberg Pomona came out, which also had be bend levers, and I spent about a week trying to make it sound okay. And it sounds like you know, it, <laughs> it sounds like someone who spent a week trying to learn how to play lap lap steel. Um, but th the different headspace it puts you in is. Yeah. Just so cool. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So cool. And you think that really is the birth of electric guitar. Yeah. That, so that the, whole thing. The resonator was designed to make the guitar poke out in a big band. And it's like... No, no, no. He means a lap steel. The electric one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. The Hawaiian thing that was Hawaiian and that ended up in Western Swing. And oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. I was talking about a resonator. Oh, were you? Yeah. Oh, okay. Which isn't a lap steel. I thought you were talking about a national... Because I think they made them as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I presume they made them as well. Yeah. But the the this one was designed to be played like this. It's had a the the neck was basically a square block. Yeah. Well, that and, could that that is still a lap steel. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. 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 yeah squ literally square necks, didn't they? Mm hmm. Hmm. Maybe we should find someone who's good at playing them. I bet John Smith can play them. I bet he's amazing. I bet he's quite good. There was a guy at Bristol, actually. Now, what was his name? Um, I did a video with him for guitarist. Martin something. He was really good. Uh, oh, Marty. Yeah. Marty Lappy Steelo. Marty Steel. Marty Steelo. <laughs> Steelo. Uh, Steelo. I see everything twice. Um... Hi again, says I see everything twice. I've been experimenting with boosts and overdrives. Is there a difference in the way they react with delay and reverb? Would driving the preamp have a deleterious effect versus pedal distortion? Deleterious. Does that mean a deleting? Is that, that's a great outfit. That's a real word. I'm using it. <laughs> deleterious. Causing harm or damage. Love that band. Am I just saying? Come it wrong? on, baby, let's kiss this thing. Deleterious. Is it? Am I just saying it wrong? What's the pronunciation? Sabarius. I must be saying it wrong. Um, anyway, so it's this little play button that you can listen to the, the pronunciation. Go up, back up again. There, it is. scroll down. It's here, isn't it? Deleterious. 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 She sounds great. Deleterious. Very Deleterious. Good. I've never heard that word before. In flipping God it's harmful or negative. Okay. Uh, anyway, so um, would driving a preamp uh, have a bad effect compared with pedal distortion? Right. It's all about order. It doesn't matter how the overdrive is created, whether or whether it's created in the amp. 
let's here is if we go guitar overdrive delay clean amp this is it, it deleterious is <laughs> Deladarying an overdriven signal. This is just this is delaying what it what it sees here. So this creates the grr, and then this goes grr 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 grr. Yeah. So it's taking whatever sound this is and replicating that a number of times. And it doesn't matter whether this is loads of distortion or less distortion. It's, this is fine. This is always just going to do it fine. This is a non deleterious setup situation. Exactly. Now, if we do that, we keep the amp clean, but we hit the delay first, but we do the overdrive second. Mm -hmm. What happens now? So now the clean sound hits here and goes spling, 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 spling. And then the spling hits the overdrive and it goes spling, spling, spling. And the, and I like it. Like that. And not only that, if this goes spling, 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 this will go spling, 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 spling. <laughs> because, <laughs> because this is acting not only as a distortion device, but as a, as a limiter, so that even as the spling from the delay pedal, the repeats get quieter, this is compressing those quieter sounds and making them... It's amplifying so, so much. Exactly. So that is what we call deleterious. Yes. Unless you play in a shoegaze band or some other kind of noise band that wants that effect. And the having double deleterious. A, having a reverb before your overdrive can just be the most fantastic texture. Yeah. But it is... In sort of standard, what we're, what the, the nature of your question is not what we're looking for. Now... Let's remove the overdrive pedal and assume that the overdrive's coming from our amp. So we had guitar overdrive delay for the desired outcome. And the less, the deleterious effect, the less desired outcome would be guitar delay overdrive. Yeah. So then now let's say we're not using an overdrive pedal. Now let's say the amp is overdriving. What have we got now? We've got uh, guitar delay overdrive. So the way <laughs> the way you get the delay after the overdrive is to put it in the effects loop because it goes guitar overdrive. Sorry, guitar overdrive delay delay exactly. So it's just about the order of the effects where you have your distortion. So. Is there a difference in the way they interact with delay and reverb? Yes, there is. The other effect is if you boost very heavily into your delay, the delay will get louder as well. Mm. So You're changing the gain structure of the... A little bit like Rob's question earlier about um, if you have a channel switching amp and you change something in the nature of what you're boosting into the delay pedal, if it's in the loop or if it's on your board. The, the, the difference in the affected sound can be massive, which is why we would advocate using um, a... I noticed I've started really gesticulating wildly. It's because we haven't been to Italy in a while and I just, it's just saying, yeah. your body's saying, come on, yeah. let's get back. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, so which is why using a, an expression pedal in the effect can be really useful because you can change the change the tone of it. And then on top of all of that, if if this isn't a confusing enough answer, is the nature of the pedal itself. So into a digital delay, usually has plenty of headroom, you can whack it with overdrives and boosts and it'll usually be all right. If you do that with an analog delay pedal, it'll overdrive. There you go. And the delay pedal itself will start overdriving. So it's all about in the first instance, it's about effect order. In the second instance, it's about the effects themselves um, and how much signal they can take, which is right back to what we were talking about earlier. Why the whole problem with amp effects loops, line level, instrument level, 
send and return recovery and all of that became a problem in the first place because of the differentiation in levels, which I think is kind of what your question is about. The deleterious nature of the... Yeah. So would driving the preamp have a different effect than pedal distortion? It depends where the delay is. It depends where the delay is in the chain and it depends on the nature of the delay pedal itself. The theory is the same. If you're hitting the delay pedal with overdrive and level, yeah, that's going to be fine generally. That's what effects loops are for. If you're hitting the overdrive with the delay pedal, i.e. the delay pedal is before the overdrive in the amp, that's where you start getting, I don't want to say worse sounds because they're not worse. They're just probably not what you want. They're not clean and predictable and all that. I think the word you're looking for is deleterious. deleterious. <laughs> Thanks for that. I hope, I hope that explains it. Um, I've learned more about tone and gear in the last five years watching TPS than I did in the first 20 years of playing, says Sean Jeremilatos. Thank you for the education and entertainment. I look forward to it every week. Thank oh, you, Sean. Thanks, Sean. We've learned loads as well, and we oh, continue to learn. Yeah, it's every day's a school day. Yeah, I think if we'd stopped learning and we were just regurgitating stuff that we had learned, it would be boring. But the learning continues. John O'Neill says, does anyone know what guitar Dan is playing? So this is a Carl Longbottom. Uh, he, he made a couple of guitars he made an S type guitar and a T type guitar and I really like the T type guitar but I said I'll, I I want you to do a because uh, I've got awesome T type guitars uh, I've got amazing Telecasters even um, can we put a couple of wide range humbuckers and a, and a Strat trem on it and he went yeah and uh, it's, it's wonderful. Um, so yeah, so these are actually Monty's wide range humbuckers. And it's, it's a glorious sounding thing. Yeah. But there's a lovely neck. Carl's a great guy. I've really missed. It's jolly resonant. It, yeah, it's a semi hollow. Mm. It's also that, full of springs. <laughs> Um, Dweedle D and Dweedle Do wants to know if we could explain the same idea with delay in reverb versus reverb into delay. Yeah, I, um, are you delaying your reverb or are you reverbing your delay? Exactly that. And if you just get a reverb and delay and you swap them around, you'll hear it instantly, the difference. Yeah, it's and very it, hard to do vocal examples of, of those two. Yeah. <laughs> and it depends on the nature of the delay. Is it multi-head? Is it single-head? What's the character of the repeats? Same with the reverb. Is it a long reverb? Is it a short one? Blah, blah, blah. And you might find that, like, I don't know, a short room reverb into a slapback echo would be really cool. But a flipping giant, washy, ambient uh, twinkle toes reverb. What's it called? I always forget the name. Um, Ice pack. Um, <laughs> shimmer. Shimmer. Reverb. Ice pack reverb. <laughs> Come on, someone do an ice pack algorithm. <laughs> oh, that's really lovely. It, it might be that that reverb into a delay would just create a, a, a big, messy, brilliant, fantastically unpredictable wash, which at, you might not want. At some point, there's going to be someone on a praise and worship um, forum say so what was the reverb you used in that track oh it was an ice pack uh, ice pack <laughs> reverb the shimmer became used a bit too much but I found this ice pack algorithm and it's <laughs> wonderful I'm sure there are ones called icicle and stuff aren't there there's icicle yeah there's icicle is a delay thing I think is that the... in the timeline yeah I think so something like that yeah anyway um, Graham Martinelli hi Graham he said would you consider a show on the CXM78 like the Automatone episode, the visual representation of overdrive distortion fuzz effects on the sliders was cool, 
but it would gr be great to see the same for reverb. Yeah, that's interesting. Dan and I both love that pedal with something approaching zeal and uh, murderous love. It, yeah. Uh, yeah, it is it is the most glorious thing. There are, there are some really sci-fi type sounds you can get out of it, but there is nothing that you can't you can get out of that thing that it that you can't use. I, I've sat down with reverb pedals and think, well, this is really cool, but in never in a million years can I use this. But I sit down with CXM, everything is like, oh, I, I'm going to use this and I'm going to use this and this part. It's yeah, just it's magic. It really is. I incredible. have four presets on mine: a short room reverb, which is if you tune a Strat to E flat, it is the Hendrix in the room sound yeah uh, a small plate a bigger plate and a giant reverberating modulated shimmering hall and it's just brilliant it is and incredible. i use it i use every preset it's just such a great pedal um it, it, interesting about the sliders and explaining that because i find a lot of those devices very confusing i don't know if other reverbs have the same functionality like where you can so you've got bass, middle, and treble uh, levels on the reverb, and you can set the crossover point. Yeah. Or you've got bass and treble. And bass you and treble and crossover. Crossover, yeah, yeah, yeah. So which is essentially the similar thing. Um, now I don't know if that exists in other reverb pedals because I can't go re diving into menus to find it, but perhaps they do. I mean, certainly any Lexicon two twenty four. Uh, simulation really ought to have that yeah i to be honest i don't know um if the big sky i know depending on the engine that you're using you got a couple of different uh options as far as what the um i think what the what are they call the parameter one parameter two knobs do but just having a straight out and out um, EQ, you know, on the on the mix. Um. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe we could do that show, Graham. Um. Yeah, maybe we could and, and and weave some more useful information about reverb into that. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Brent H. Hello, Brent. He says, I'm curious on your thoughts on the Victory V4 Sheriff and Duchess. What would be the closest equivalent in headroom of an all tube amp? And what would you choose between these, a heavily attenuated all tube amp or a Victory V4? OK, so for those of you, I think uh, presumably, Brent, you mean the V4 guitar amp. So it's got a preamp and the Class D 180 watt power amp in it. I hope that's what you're talking about, because they also confusingly do a V4 just preamp, which has no power section. So the v V4 Victory, well, there's one in the... I should, Anyway, oh, I'm going to get it done. Okay, I'm going to go and get it. Because I think it helps the discussion. Yeah. So, it's a really interesting pedal. When, um, remember, when, before they released them, you know, Lee gave me a call and had a chat about it and told me what they're doing. It's really clever. And basically, it's a valve preamp that you can switch you can connect to say your 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 deluxe um your hot rod deluxe any amp with a an effects loop and it gives you another channel it gives you another valve preamp channel which is really cool um yeah i think they've come across a whole bunch of really interesting valves and went what, what can we do and they've designed these preamps and they sound fantastic uh, there is a, 
how many of them are there? I think there's one for the most of the victory range. There's certainly another one for the Kraken, which is great. Um, but yeah, the Duchess is the one that I was always always liked. Let's see, so he's found it. There we go. Yeah, I saw it. And it has a built-in power amp as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. So that is uh, a preamp and a power amp. It's a whole guitar amp. It's got speaker output on the back. Uh, it's even got some two notes cab sim stuff in it, so you can go direct. So it is a uh, 180 watt into four ohms guitar amplifier. So you can sit that on top of your um, cabinet, and that's all you need. And Dan, how heavy is it? Are oh, you joking? Weighs less than a pigeon carrying a <laughs> V4 power amp. Which is how we're measuring things from now on. Yeah. How many pigeons is it? It's carrying? exactly the weight of that <laughs> minus the pigeon. <laughs> so the question is, how does it compare? What would you compare it to in terms of headroom? I did the um, original demos for these with Chris Buck when this came out. And 180 watts should be really loud, shouldn't it? And it is really loud. It's it, it will keep up with the Hot Rod Deluxe just about, I would say, if not a little more. But it's the nature of the transient delivery and the inherent way that it puts the power out that makes it feel different. Right. I tried it with a uh, the Celestian Neo speaker, Copper, I think it was called, the speaker, right. something like that. And I really strongly disliked it right. in a big way. I, d I much preferred it into a regular ceramic speaker. Sure. Because it was like, all the things you don't really want about a Class D power amp. Amplified. Like, yeah, and yeah, all yeah, the yeah, things yeah. you don't want about a Neo speaker. Sure. Coming from the context of someone who's used to a valve power stage and classic ceramic speakers, right? So that's my my bias, if you like, my my prefer my personal preferences in sound. Two things I don't like married up. That into a 412, different story. Yeah, right. Yeah. And actually into the I quite liked it into uh what was it? Maybe like an Alnico. Gotta be a bit careful, obviously, because it's putting out 180 watts. At four ohms, so it wants to be seeing a pretty powerful speaker. Sure. Okay. So I would say it keep up with the Hot Rod Deluxe, no problem at all. Um, maybe even amps more powerful than that. Mm. Uh, it's quite impressive, and it's all analog, obviously. Class D doesn't mean digital. Class D is uh, doesn't. That's not what Class D means. Um, we should, yeah, maybe we'll use it as use it on the show one day and just answer that question more okay, fully. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I would choose that every day of the week over uh, a digital modelling device. Yeah. Like oh, every day of every yeah, yeah, week yeah, yeah, for yeah. the rest of time. Yeah. Uh, I haven't actually heard the two note stuff in it. Um, they added that later after I'd been involved, but yeah. Yeah. Certainly loud enough to gig. Certainly easily loud enough to gig. Yeah. Um, it's nice. Try and work out why it's only got one foot switching. Because that's oh, a cause tremolo. Because there's no channel switching. The copper, yeah. I think, has got channel switching. Hope that helps. Um, I love the artwork. You liked it. Oh, I think it's fun. I think it's fun. I said I didn't like the artwork. Okay. But that's just you know, just personal, isn't it? Just personal preference. Um. For a duchess, she's had a rough life. Yeah. Dustin Thiessen says, apparently the Neo Creamback is actually really good. I've, interesting with Neo speakers, off-axis in the room, I've always quite enjoyed how they sound. The second you put a mic in front of them, I'm, I'm like, hmm, I've got stuff to fix here. But, may, I mean, this this is a few years ago now, so maybe maybe listening to the latest crop would be less crap. That thing is as big, big as my pedal board, says Joan. Yeah, but Joan, it's a guitar amp. <laughs> it's a whole guitar amp. It's a whole 180 watt guitar amp. 
Indeed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Indeed. Um, good. SMA says, can we get the jazz chorus back on the show? Says SMA. Um, the jazz chorus we had belongs to Dave Gregory. I don't have one. I have no real intent on buying one, but ah, oh, we could get it back on. We'll grab Dave. We'll do the firework. We'll do the the um the Firebird show, and we'll someone will wheel the jazz chorus in the background, <laughs> and then take it back out again, <laughs> so we can tick that box. We should we should try and get one. But you can still pick them up for sensible money, can't you? I don't know. I don't know if you can now. Noah Jugo or Noah Ugao or Noah Jugo. Jugo. Yeah, it was great. I'm obviously losing it at this point. He's from Australia, so it's probably Jugo, isn't it? Jugo! Jugo! Hey! Jugo! <laughs> Recently, I got my first channel switching amp, a 4x10 Tech 21 Trademark 60. Love the new options with the two channels. Also, after the biscuit talks in the recent VCQ, here's some dollars for Dan to get some Tim Tams for mixed. Ah <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Will Noah. do. Thank you, Noah. Thank you. Uh, I didn't know they did a 421 trademark 60. 4 to 410. I played. My, uh, I played in a pub band uh, for ages, and I can't remember what we were called. With Tim Slater, who used to be the deputy editor on. Guitar Buyer and also Guitarist Magazine. What were we called? It was a great band. And he quite often played a trademark 60 in that in that band. It sounded really good. But that was a 112. Oh, I wish I could remember. Joyrider. Joyrider was the name of the band. Ah. <laughs> uh. Sorry. <laughs> Getting all a bit emotional. We're booking our um, waltzing Matt Gilbert. Booking our flights for Sydney at Christmas. How are you going? We're going to go. Nice. Going to Sitters for quizzes. We'll actually be in Brisbane for Christmas. I know. We'll be, yeah, we'll be at the Sunshine Coast for, for Christmas. Yeah. But we're gonna. Our budget allows us to fly to Sydney and walk to Brisbane. <laughs> flights are expensive at the moment, aren't they? Oh. Like even just like normal everyday flights, let alone going to Australia at Christmas. It is silly. Yeah. Uh, good. Um, Brian Carpenter, hello Brian. Good day, gents. Uh, new app day. Vox AC15 with a cream back. Now running wet dry with my OR15. Dan. Would you recommend the Electro Harmonics Electric Mistress Deluxe reissue? Yeah, I think they all sound great. Andy Summers has just released the Walking on the Moon flanger with uh, Electro Harmonics. I haven't heard it yet, but I'm sure it'll be great. But I think all of the Electric Mistress uh, variants from Electro Harmonic all have that thing. Yeah. They all sound really, really great. Even the... Nano. The Nano sounds yeah. fantastic. Yeah, I mean, Dan would say that nothing really sounds like his original one. Um, and that's true. But yeah, it'd be good to get the Andy Summers one. Yeah. Because presumably he wouldn't have signed off on something that wasn't up to snuff. Oh, let's get him on the show to show us how he uses it. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Andy, if you're watching. Hang on. I interviewed Andy. And he said, I predict in the future you will start that pedal show and I shall come on to that pedal show. I did have his number, but it's gone. All right. Chris Quinn. After the Hendrix talk... Pulled Band of Gypsies album. Machine Gun is unsurpassed. Everything about volume and dynamics. It's a bloodbath. Heart in mouth. Heart eye mouth in, says Chris Quinn. Uh, yeah. We we touched on this last week. It does... If you're not into Hendrix, it 
you you either get it or you don't, and then it might take a bit of work after right. that. Right. But yeah, I agree. <laughs> Add Univibe. <laughs> yeah. Mike twenty two oh three. Okay, Mike, I've got a video coming up for you. It says, have you had any tuning issues with strap whammy bars? I find lube necessary, nut sauce, to avoid tuning instability and string snapping. Yeah. There is a quite an in-depth video that I'm in. I've just started editing on this whole topic. It is beautiful. Lots of people. Mick was really showing me something they had it before. And oh, man, it is, it is superb. It should, it should go on like, the History Channel or something on Netflix. Nut, nutflax. <laughs> nutflax. That's the that's the that's the that's the non-slip. <laughs> There's our new home. Yeah, Mike. That I mean, and that is absolutely the best place to start because quite a lot of people go, "Oh, this blooming vibrato is rubbish. It doesn't work. It's a load of crap." So I lock it flat. Actually, start with all the bits on the bits on the guitar where there's potential friction. Get those lubed up, as you say. Uh, and that will improve everything else as well for tuning. And then there's a few things that, that you need to do at the bridge as well. Did you do that? No, I'm not sure about that. Okay. Matt swears by it. Carl Verheyen swears, but swears by it. So who am I to argue with them? Just show them what that is. Check this out. Point it up towards the light. Mm. Tilt it back. There you go. There you go. So Carl Verheyen and Matt from Monty's advocate screwing the bass side in more than the treble side. I, it might work. I couldn't look at it. Right. <laughs> You're the best. That would do my nothing to know yeah, that was like that. on the back of you, just knowing it was like that. Yeah, that would absolutely do my nothing. That's great. And I find they work fine without doing that. So um, yeah, okay. One thing I do want to know. So, what love is Darren um, Braun did the most fantastic video on all vibrato bridges and said they can all be set up to be in tune, but they all have one problem. Right. And he plays this lick, and I, don't know, I can't remember what the lick was, and he bends the bar down. So he goes. Or maybe he doesn't bend the bridge down. Maybe he just does a big bend. And it bends the bridge down to the point where the guitar isn't in tune. So what he's saying is, and I can't, oh God, I'm, I'm, I'm probably getting this wrong. The point being, every single bridge he tried, PRS, Fender 2 point, 6 point, Kayla, V-Trem, all of them required a manual reset. Oh, okay. Because you know when you go like, on a Strat, if you do this, when it comes back up, it needs that. Yep. Yeah, right. And he had his tuner attached to the headstock and he just showed that each time the, the, the G string was a few cents strat and you, uh, strat, flat. And you always need to just back into. And my question was, did this solve that? That's quite the block in there. jazz version uh yeah mike whole video coming up on that and i hope it will be helpful chris chris says hey dnm love you guys you helped me get back into guitar after a long hiatus can you comment on eq graphic versus parametric where in the chain and pedal recommendations such as empress hampstead sorso audio mxr etc um i have never used a graphic eq in my guitar rig ever. We've, we've done some exhaustive videos on it and it's a massive topic it's worth 
watching the video, but just quickly, um, difference between a, a graphic and a parametric EQ. Graphic EQ is going to have the sliders where it'll boost or cut at a specific frequency, and those frequencies are set. A parametric EQ generally gives you a couple of options where you can set the frequency within a range and then boost or cut that frequency. So a parametric EQ is really good at things like notch filters. Um, so for example, you know, one control uh, most of them will have is a thing called the Q. So let's say you set the frequency at 1K, you can set the Q, which is how wide it'll go like above and below 1K. So you might get this, if it's really sharp, you might get this really narrow point up to 1K and just bring 1K down. Or a quite wide thing, so it'll bring a lot of the upper and lower mids down with it as well. Um, and then you can cut or boost that frequency. The, the, the nice thing about a parametric EQ is then you can boost the frequency or cut it, and then you can sweep the frequency yeah. to find the frequency you're looking for. They, they, they do similar jobs, but um, you know, I, I like a, a graphic EQ is great for basic tone shaping. Parametric EQ is really good for sweeping frequencies and finding specific things to do a specific job. It's more a post application, I would say, parametrics. Right. Um, so if I'm doing any post audio work, band mix, individual guitar mixes, whatever, parametric EQ is, is just vital right. for that, for getting it to sit. Perhaps a little bit overkill, just just for setting up basic sounds. Sure. Would you say when you've got so much scope with something like an MXR10 band? Yeah, but and I think that the other thing with the graphic e EQ is you can see exactly, like it's, you can see the shape. It's there. It's you know you've boosted yeah. and cut, and it's so easy to dial in. Yeah, with the, the parametric. It's easier, I should say. I, I, perhaps before, I mean, you you may already have the answer to this question, but. The question is, what are you using it for? What? Why do you think you need a graphic EQ? And if, if you've got the answer to that question, the next bit should be easy in terms of which one you should buy. Because one common use for a graphic EQ would be to level out some differences between two very different guitars. So let's say you've got a Strat with EMGs and you've got a Les Paul with muddy humbuckers. Yeah. It might be that one of those guitars needs a tweak so that you're not having to do radical changes elsewhere on your board or at the amp to make the guitars sit together. If that's the case, you should be able to work out pretty quickly what the frequencies are going to be. It's going to be two to 400 hertz and it's going to be something in the upper mid range yeah. for the EMGs. So that might help. But if you're, let me just read the question again. If you're getting back into it after a long time, Chris, I would maybe even give the EQ a miss and just set up a good basic tone mm. with a couple pedals and an amp and just rediscover the love of playing and try not to fall down that rabbit hole too far of constant tweaking when actually at this point, if you're just getting back into it, the hours what? into playing and enjoying it would, would probably yield you better results. Yeah, And then if a while into that, you're like, actually, I really do need to tweak this. It, for me, an EQ is like a last resort. It's a, it's a, I've got a problem and it's going to cost me $150 to fix it sure. rather than $2,000. Uh, sorry, $8,000. Do, do you think so or, or not? I think... You're bang on. If you're uh, if you're plugging into an amplifier and you're just starting to get back into it, that an EQ won't. It's pro, the, the odds of the EQ being a, a big help are, uh, are limited. If you've got. Um, once you once you're there, and once you you know you're doing your thing, and you really understand the sound that's coming out, it's like this is really good. But what I need is a bit more mids or a bit less mids for this particular part. But you should be able to dial something into your amplifier yeah. as it is that gives you enough to get going. Yeah, yeah. Stu Crombie says apparently that was Jeff Beck's tip with the trim. Oh, was it claw? 
Right. In which case, I'm doing it tomorrow. <laughs> he was the king. You have to go and redo your, your <laughs> vlog now. I do mention it. I do mention it in the vlog. Um, okay, how are we getting on? Uh, Joe Halliday. Hello, Sailor. Hello, Joe. He says, um, great episode on Friday. I see these standard Fender amps in a whole new light after playing the deluxe reverb at volume. It has the sound I've been chasing for years. Is that the lick? Sniff it. Is that it? Pretty much. Right. That I love that. That because it sounds out of key. It's so cool. Yeah. That's nice. That's yeah. Nice. I like it. Um, that's my lick. Uh, so Joe came to a recent experience day, and one of the things we do on experience day, depending on how the day's going, is. I get everyone in here and we say, right, look, all this stuff is insanity world. Let's go back to Sensible. And we plug a Les Paul into a deluxe reverb and we go three, five, seven, ten, and we crank it up to make the point that I think that's what most of us are chasing most of the time. Right. But actually, that's not very practical. It's either too loud or not loud enough, basically. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> then we get into this. <laughs> quite how that happened i don't know but uh, and joe you're right it, it's such a great it's such a great sound bit like dan's ac30 you know it works there yep before that it don't work after, after that, that it, it don't work no that's right and if you can deal with this it's perfect yep absolutely. but dealing with that <laughs> is a problem yeah but yeah it's yeah it, oh, i don't know i'm always surprised when you crank that when you crank that amp it's it is that amp or that amp yep. or it's a lovely thing mm -hmm. nice to hear from you joe yeah you mate. Well, mate um basil tiffany basil tiffany does this make sense to you the tone in my head conflicts with the frequencies i like i want clear and bright but the frequencies are a bit that i like are a bit muffled You've got a problem there with psychological time. It's exactly what I was trying to think of. It's like, yeah, that's not... That, to me, is the wrong question. Yeah. So there is the current moment, right? There is presence. There is what is actually happening now. And there is psychological time. And psychological time is all the thoughts in your head. And somehow you've got to, you've got to put the psychological time over to one side, the things you think, and get on with the things that are. And that sounds very, very esoteric and possibly even a little bit hippy-tastic. But you've just got to go with what you like in that moment. Yeah, absolutely. You don't have to think about that too much. Um, and then I suppose there is a real, there could be a, an actual practical problem there. So you like this sound that's a bit more, bit, to use your word, muffled. Um, but that's a problem in the band because no one can hear you. So, yeah, then you, you do need to fix some sort of uh, compromise there. No, so it doesn't sound weird because I think we all deal with, with that all the time. Yeah. You know, there's sounds that I like in my head from other guitar players and using other gear that I just love. But every time I try it, it sucks. <laughs> yeah. And you've just got to do your thing, haven't you? So, yeah. It, it, is there actually a practically an issue here? Does it cause a problem in some sort of playing scenario? The answer to that is no. Play the, play the tones you like. Yeah. It's also depending on the context and what you're playing there are some sounds that um shall as you say muffled that can work in a mix that isn't too dense especially if you're playing like a, in in a three piece for example um you can get away with it's amazing what you can get away with um but as soon as the the frequency uh, bandwidth starts getting taken up with stuff, then it becomes a real problem. Yeah. Um, 
so yeah it, it, it it's all about the context but absolutely play what you like there's no need to overthink it if <laughs> as in as in when when you find if you're playing in that situation like i i i can't be heard i can't hear myself then you've got a problem and you can explore that yeah and but there's don't create a problem where there isn't one mm. yeah i think that's fair I think that's fair. Even though there's a bit of uh, pot calling the kettle black here. Dan and I spend our lives creating problems where there aren't any, but we'll just, we're learning. We're learning to deal with that as time goes on. Hayden Gist, or Gist, Hayden says, when you mentioned that Hayden would be judging the random pedal challenge, it blew my mind because we share the same name. Yes. Yeah, Hayden, I don't think Hayden's been on camera for TPS. Hayden helps out packing orders in the store and doing all that. And then we discovered that um, he, he can actually edit and help us with filming too. Hayden plays guitar. I went to ACM. Yep. So we've chained him to the uh, editing room. Yep. And uh, every now and then we'll... No more guitar players required around here. Exactly. Thank you very much. Yep. <laughs> so yeah, he's Hayden. Hayden without uh, an E. Hayden, as in the composer. Hayden. Okay. Hayden. Hayden. But it's right. Hayden. Hey! Hmm? Yeah, and we call him Lord Hades of Valhalla. Is his actual kennel name. They... In fact, good. it's Lord, the Lord High Hades of Valhalla. Yeah. 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 And some kind, sometimes we call him the real Slim Hades. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so good. And he is a lovely chap, and he is very talented, and uh, he really helps us do what we do. Had a number of people asking how we're going with uh, the Johnny Marr thing. Uh, it is happening. We it's don't have a date. Happening. It is happening. Uh, there was talk about doing him when he comes to Froome in August, but actually Johnny's got a book coming out later in the year and we've decided it'd be better to go to him at his studio so we can actually get into some of his guitars. Oh, I damn. Hope. We actually have to go to his studio oh, no. and so, play some of Johnny's guitars. So I hope... Oh, <laughs> I hope, shucks. I hope everyone agrees that's a better solution, even though it's going to be a bit longer to wait. But um, obviously, me and Dan are both like... <laughs> about that. So, yeah. Yeah. Of course, it'll be a second time for me, Daniel. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Robbie Howard is last up today. Robbie... Uh, uh, sorry, we've gone on a bit long today, with apologies to uh, everyone who that affects. Um, but it's good to talk. It is. Mm. Robbie Howard says, Hey, Legends, do you know when to refret your guitar? My frets look flat, but I am still not sure. Peace. Yes. Uh, it's time. If well, look... depending on how much meat you got left on the fret, you might be able to get away with just getting them oh, yeah, with, a, with a Yeah, with a fret dress. Um, but it's hard to tell if you're if if you don't do this stuff yourself. Take it along to a a, a luthier, someone who understands these things, and they'll be able to work out how much meat is left on the fret of the the lowest part of the lowest fret, and that will dictate whether or not you need a full refret or whether you can get away with having it dressed. If you can get away with having it dressed, great. I would do, I think Johnny would normally do two or three full fret dresses. Once he'd refretted my, once he refretted red, there'd be two or three full fret dresses before it needed a, a refret again. But I was using 6105s, which were a tall fret. So, it, you know, I had quite a lot of things to play with there. Um, but by the time... I needed a full refret. They were just, yeah, you know, there was nothing left. I, I, I had this done, the sixty-one, which we made a video on, made a whole video on it. Uh, we've we've done it with some other guitars that we've had refretted, mm -hmm. and I I would just say that it was worth it and then some on oh, both yeah. guitars. Yeah. I, I guess it's. Um, if you can get away with getting a fret dress it's going to save you some cash but if it's hard to play and you know it's it's borderline then just get it 
you know, and you can pony up the dough. But if you play it every day and you love it, don't bother. <laughs> sure. But there are things that become progressively that you sort of overlook. Absolutely. And that's definitely where it got to on blue and... And, and that is something that um, Tom... Uh, Matt? No. Uh, Uncle Larry? Tom Bukovac. Tom Bukovac says, whenever he buys a new guitar, vintage or whatever, first thing he does is get it refunded. Yeah, yeah. I can, um, I can see why that yeah. might be the case. Okay, thanks for being with us. Uh, Friday's video is going to be <laughs> the Nine Nations Challenge. Awesome. Dan and I picked nations out of a hat, not including the USA, Australia or the UK. Hello for all the Aussies watching. Um, And I got a country, and Dan got a country, and we had to pick gear from those countries. You nailed it. Tune in on Friday. Well, the country nailed it for me, to be fair. Tune in on Friday to find out what occurred. I'm going to say it's one of the best guitar interamp tones I can remember having in years. Really? Yeah. I concur because of the amp. Mm. And the guitar. Yeah, 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 yeah. Play us yeah, out, yeah. Dan. Thanks All for right. being here, everyone. Thank you for your super chai. Yep. Uh, thank you for supporting that pedal show. And thanks for hanging out. It's really nice to do this on a Monday. Uh, thanks to BV, BV for lovely moderations. I'll yes, just check thanks, I haven't missed any. Uh... Yes. I have not missed anything. See you next week.